Well, let's, let's continue our series, um, this, this prayer in, in uh, the book of Ephesians, chapter 3. Um, I'm going to be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. It is starting at verse 14, and I'll read through verse 21. It says this, For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes his name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you're being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him, by the power at work within us, is able to accomplish abundantly far more than we all we can ask or imagine. To him, be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Paul writes to us that this love is so vast and so weighty and so dynamic that we need a whole new renovation and transformation to happen within us so that we can be able to grasp it to get our arms around it. Reading comprehension has always been a challenge for me. Um, I, I don't know if anyone else is in that place where when you read something, you read through it and then you pause and you say, I have no idea what I just read. I forgot that I was reading and I have to go back and reread what I just read through. And then you go back and read through it and then halfway through you realize that you're thinking about something else again. That, that is the place that I, I find myself in so often. And then you come across books that are like this. This is 930 pages of commentary on the book of Ephesians. 930 pages for about a three to four letter uh, page letter in the Bible. Where you read through this and you read, man, this is so dense and so academic that you go through it and as you're studying and powering through it, you stop and you just go, why can they not just write like normal people? challenge. That Paul writes to the church that we would be a people that would be able to comprehend. And he's writing that it's not just that we'd be a people that we'd be able to get our mind around the information that is being uh, given to us, that we would be a people that would be transformed by the words that we're reading. That we'd be a people that would, when he talks about grasping, that we'd be a people that would be able to embrace this. That we'd be a people that, that this would be something that would become so dynamic and so living within us. So he simply writes this, and maybe not so simply, but he writes this in verse 18. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend. I've been looking at this passage this week, and I've been thinking about the fact that we no longer have a cross on the top of our worship center. You've likely noticed that, and that we've chatted about that in the past. And uh, by the way, Pastor Kevin is diligently working with our insurance company to bring that to resolution, and he is faithfully uh, doing that. It's going in a great direction. But here's what we found out, is that the weight of the cross was too heavy for our building to be able to handle that there was something about the structural integrity, there was something about the strength of the beams of our building, that they were not able to hold on to the weight of a 15,000-pound cross. Go figure. (laughs) On the outside, everything looked fine until it didn't. (laughs) Suddenly, there was a slant to it. Our building needed more of an inner strength that it did not have. And so we had to contact our insurance. We had to contact a construction company and say, we need help because this building cannot hold on to, under its own strength, the weight of the cross. 
I think about that because as Paul prays for the church of Ephesus, he prays some few things that would happen within us, and I will bring it up on the screen. He prays that we would be strengthened in our inner being with power through his spirit. And the second thing is, and that Christ would dwell within us as we are being rooted and grounded in love so that we would have the power to comprehend his love for us. I love this. This is Paul is talking to us. He prays that we would be strengthened in our inner being with power through his spirit so that we would have the power to comprehend. This is a power-packed, run-on sentence that the Apostle Paul is praying for the church in Ephesus and for all of the saints. And as you look through it, you'll notice this. We'll again bring it up on, on the screen for you. He says that we would be strengthened, and that word strengthened means that we that there would be a ruling power that would happen in our lives, that our lives would be dominated and ruled by the power of God. So he prays that we would have the, this, this new reign that would happen over us in our inner being, that Jesus would reign over our lives. This ruling power would come over our inner beings. And that, that a dynamic living power would happen within us, an achieving power, an operational type power, an everyday living kind of a power would come and, and, and be breathed into us through the power of his spirit so that we would have the power to grasp, to understand that we would have assurance and confidence, that, that it would become inherent to who we are, that this would become a part of who we are, that this power would reside within us, that we would be a changed people as we comprehend his love for us. Ultimately, Paul is praying that we would have a greater capacity to understand and comprehend the love of Christ. I want you to know the wonders of Christ's love. But listen, this love is so vast and so dense and so deep and so enduring that there is no way that in your own power you can get your arms around this kind of a love. There's no way. That you, can, that you can, under your own strength, comprehend or grasp the love that God has for you. So I'm praying that the power of God's Spirit would be infused into your life so that you can understand this kind of a love. Maybe for us comic book nerds, we can kind of look at it this way that when you look over the Marvel stories is that just a mere mortal cannot, under their own power, grasp the Infinity Stones, right? That they don't have the ability to do that, to be able to grasp these Infinity Stones would just absolutely destroy you. And that there needed to be a more of empowering. And so you see, as you look over the Marvel movies, that, that people needed something like Thanos' glove to be able to hold on to these things. And so it is this place of understanding that, that the Spirit of God is what allows us to be able to better understand and be assured of the love of God. The other thing that Paul then encourages us into is that, we, that Christ would dwell in us and that we'd be rooted and grounded in love so that we'd be able to have the power to comprehend. In order to be able to understand God's love for us, Jesus needs to make his home within us. The reinforcement that happens throughout the structure of the building is Jesus. The prayer of Paul here is that he would get into every space of our lives. That Jesus needs to get into wherever there is a void in the structural integrity of our building. We need the indwelling, sustaining presence of Jesus so that we might be able to understand and grasp his love for us. Listen, it was such a gift when Larissa's parents moved in to our home, when they made their home amongst us. Because here's one of the things that ended up happening, is that now as a family, we had greater, greater capacity. We had greater resources. 
There was more power happening within the walls of our home because her parents moved in with us. Suddenly we found out that we had time as a couple to be able to go out on date nights because babysitters <laughs> lived in our home. I would sometimes put my clothes into the dryer as I headed off to work, and then I came home and discovered that all of my socks were folded. There was a greater resource that was happening within our home. It was an absolute blessing to have them living within us, within our home. And, and so Paul prays that this, this kind of understanding that Christ would make himself more at home in every space of our lives. That as he does so, that that would give us greater capacity, that that would give us greater resource to be able to get our arms around who he is. The prayer of Augustine that I would encourage us to also pray, though, is this. Narrow is the mansion of my soul. Enlarge thou it, that thou mayest enter in. But the prayer of our hearts is that God would make his home in our lives. He also prays within this, this same um, sentence here is that Christ would dwell within us as we are rooted and grounded in love. These are the, this is the language of both a, a tree and a building that Paul continues to have that language and that dynamic language with throughout his letter. And, and so that here's, here's the idea, is that the, the imagine a building, that the building and the foundation, or imagine a skyscraper, that it first needs to go deep before it could ever go high. And that, that, that we would be rooted and grounded in Christ's love if we're ever to be able to get our arms around this kind of love. I've shared before in the past that I love logos. I love logos. I love what they communicate. I love that at glance that, that you could sit there and, and have, get a message that comes across in them in an instant, but then also logos that you could just sit with and study and look at. And so I... Design, I didn't really design it. I took a couple of images from all over the internet and I kind of combined them together to make a logo for this sermon series. Because I wanted something, I'm such a visual person, I wanted something to be able to look at and to communicate to me what Paul is praying for us here in the book of Ephesians. That we'd be like a tree that is saturated in his love. This would be our foundation. That no other place will give us the ability to comprehend the love of Christ. That if we are to grasp and experience the breadth and length and height and depth of Jesus' love, then we must constantly be, be we constantly must reject being grounded anywhere else. That our prayer is to say, no other place than the love of Christ is where I want to be grounded in. No other soil will work. I came across this thought recently from Jackie Hill Perry, where she, um, in summarizing, says this, so God instructs us to himself because to instruct us to anything else wouldn't just be unloving, it would be evil. This is the longer quote that she has. Commanding anything other than absolute allegiance to himself would not only be an evil for which God would require atonement for, but also the promotion of a lie. The lie being that other gods made by hands or thoughts or whatever could in fact be God too. As if, create, as if they created the heavens and the earth. As if before anything made that was made, they existed. As if they could deliver on their promises or save or justify or sanctify a sinner. But only a devil would tell such stories. And so it stands that God could never command us away from worshiping himself be rooted 
and grounded here in this love. The goal is that this love would be all-encompassing in our lives. That it would end up being that, that this love is what we express and demonstrate to the world around us it, because this is the soil that we are planted in. We reject all other grounds. We will not stand upon anything else. This is where we are grounded. This is where we are founded. C.S. Lewis tells us this. This is my endlessly recurrent, recurrent temptation, to go down to that sea. I think St. John of the Cross called God a sea. And there neither dive nor swim nor float, but only dabble and splash, careful not to get out of my depth and holding on to the lifeline which connects me with my things temporal. When Larris and I were on our honeymoon, we had, the, we had the privilege to be able to go on honeymoon in Jamaica. And we were sitting on the beach, just lounging, chatting together. And there on the shore was a couple who had hired a photographer to take their pictures together. And one of the instructions from the photographer was for the, the bride to, to lay down on, on the shore with the waves crashing behind her. And as she was laying there, suddenly a wave crashed pretty heavily right behind her and picked her up and began to sweep her out into the ocean. It's become an inside joke for us that we'll let you in on now, where when someone is just overwhelmed by something, because here's what we, 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 we shout this together, because this is what she began to shout. She began to shout out for her cousin, for her husband in such a loud pitched voice, Kevin! Kevin! As she's being washed out into the ocean. And so there will be times where we're just interacting with one another and something becomes overwhelming or something becomes too much for us. We'll just look at each other and go, get him! <laughs> it was an absolutely just beautiful picture for us <laughs> that we will never forget of this lady being washed out to the ocean. She survived. She, she's alive. She's good. In this quote that C.S. Lewis has, he later goes on to, to, to tell us, we're, we're, we're reluctant to give more than what is required of us. We ask, what is the minimum that I can give? Maybe for some of you in here, that was kind of the approach to, to your schooling. C's get degrees, <laughs> right? <laughs> what can I hold on to for myself and still be considered to be okay here? We're afraid to be fully consumed. We are afraid to lose control. We are afraid to fully let go. It is terrifying to be swept into the sea. But the call that is placed upon us is that we would be fully immersed in the loving presence of Jesus. And while that sounds so inviting, we still withhold. We still hold on to what is ours. We like the comfort of the ground that we are standing upon. But Paul's prayer for us is that, no, that let this be the place that you are rooted and grounded. Let this be that you are fully immersed in the loving presence of Jesus. Here is our hope, that we would give our lives over to be fully immersed in this love, and as we do so, we would have greater ability to comprehend and know this love. When Paul prays for the church of Ephesus, in Ephesus, he prays that they would know, not that they would just know love, 
but he makes sure to pray that they would know the love of Christ. Here is Ephesians. Here is Paul's prayer for the, for the church in Ephesus, that we would know the love of Jesus, not our own definition of what love might be, not our own places of comprehension of what love might be, but what is Christ's love. And so you see other places of Scripture that Paul makes a point to give depth and clarity to what love is. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. And it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love neither gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. God's love is not like our love. In Isaiah 55, God talks about his mercy. And more specifically, he talks about his unending compassion and love for Israel. Then he says, for my ways are not like your ways. I love in a way that is beyond anything that you could ever comprehend. My love is patient. It's not fickle. My love is kind. It isn't self-centered. It is rich and overflowing with forgiveness and grace. My love is drawn to the poor and to the powerless. My love is enduring and ongoing. It isn't fickle or weak. It has a resiliency and strength that cannot be thwarted or stopped by anything. One commentary that I came across basically summarized it by saying it this way, this love seeks the highest good in the one that is loved. His love is focused on you. Not looking for anything else in return, his love is seeking to give all of himself to you. One of the ways that you see this love beautifully expressed by humanity is actually in the book of Ruth. One of the things that takes place in this letter is that Ruth loses her husband, and she comes to her mother-in-law, Naomi, and Naomi tells her, Ruth, go back home. Go back to your own people. I'm, I'm old. I cannot give you another Son, they're basically, what Naomi's communicating to Ruth is that if you stay with me, then then all prospects of of your future flourishing are gone. And, And Ruth says this to Naomi, do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There I will be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me and more as well, even if death parts me from you. What, what Ruth demonstrates for us is a kind of love that binds itself to another and consistently demonstrates faithfulness and generosity to an astonishing degree. This is God's love. This is the kind of love that he longs for you to be rooted and grounded in. So Paul prays that we would know a love, and we would know its breadth and length and height and depth. That we would know its breadth. We would know a love that we cannot get outside of. There is no escaping this love. I think about Psalm 139 where it says, where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me fast. That we know the length of his love. 
the longevity of it. A love that is expressed from generation to generation. That we would come to know that God's love is faithful. That it's ongoing and enduring. It will not run out. It will not be depleted. He loved you before you were born and he will embrace you on the other side of the grave. His love is long. And we would know the height of his love. A love that is unmatched and unrivaled. A love that cannot be, a love that cannot be corrupted. And a love that a shadow cannot be cast over it, that we would know the depth of his love. A love that invites us to endless exploration. We cannot find the bottom to this love. That the invitation is you can eat and then devour till you have no more space and then come back tomorrow and partake again. Paul's prayer is that we would know this love. So the church would be assured that they would be confident to know, is there grief in your heart? His love is deeper. Are you experiencing a thorn in the flesh that just won't go away? His love is longer. Have you experienced a moment of absolute sheer bliss? His love is higher. Have you failed? Have you been rejected? His love is wider. I believe that the hope for Paul here is to ask this question, what if, the, what if this love really become, did become inherent to who we are? What if this love was something that couldn't be rattled or shaken out of us? Imagine what the church could endure if they were able to fully grasp this kind of love. What strength and resiliency would reside within the church if she really knew and experienced the love of God? What if our comprehension of God's love was really this rich and powerful? What if our confidence of God's love was a defining factor, uh, was the defining factor of our lives? Imagine the hardships we'd be able to endure if we knew and were rooted and grounded in this kind of love. Imagine the compassion and grace that we would be able to demonstrate to the world around us if we knew, really knew this kind of love. Imagine the way that we would be able to shed things like rivalry or comparison if we knew this kind of love. Imagine the way temptation and unhealthy desires would just lose their grip on us if we knew this kind of love. Imagine how much better we would be at discerning our unhealthy attachments if we really knew this kind of love. Imagine how much better we would be at detangling our lives from affiliations and ideologies that would call us to have allegiance to them if we really knew this kind of love. Imagine how less divisive and damaging political and social divides would be in the church if we really were rooted and grounded in this love. No other soil. No other soil. This is what we pray would overtake our lives. That Paul's prayer is that may there be a new ruling and governing power over you. And may the breath of God's spirit empower you. so that you may really be able to grasp, to understand, to get your arms around this. This is the place that we live and move and have our being. One of the things that I'm just continuing to, to learn is that Life change or a changed life is really hard. And my hope to live a different life isn't just by 
downloading more information. You've probably realized by interacting with, with people and loved ones around you that we're constantly shouting facts and competing facts at one another. And it's not resulting in changed lives. No one's minds are being changed as we're shouting all of these facts at one another. But brain science, and I believe scripture tells us that if we really want to see lives being changed, then our identities need to be changed. We, we need a new attachment. We, we need for ourselves to be consumed by the love of God. That would be the soil that we would reside in. And that all of our living would flow out of that. I came across this from, from Dallas Willard recently. And if, Brittany, if you want to come back up on stage, we'll close with this. As, can you go back to that first slide that had the red letters on it? I just want us to be reminded of this again. Paul's prayer is that we'd be strengthened, that a new ruling power would happen in our hearts. That we'd be strengthened in our being, in our inner being, and that the Spirit of God his dynamic, living, achieving, operational power would overtake us so that we would be able to grasp, understand, have assurance and confidence of his love. Have that in your mind as you hear this from Dallas Willard. The spiritually mature person is someone who has chosen the kingdom of God, God's reign over them, as their guide to what is good. And not only that, but the kingdom is understood as what will enable them to achieve and live for what is good. They have developed the knowledge and habits that keep them constantly turned toward and expectant of God and God's action in their life. This is the primary source of direction and, power and empowerment for all that concerns them in their world. For example, the spiritually mature person will look at some wrongdoing and say, why would anyone want to do that? Let's bless them instead of curse. They can do that because their mind is turned constantly to the world of God and God's presence with them. Father, I pray. that according to the riches of your glory, that you would strengthen our inner being with power through your spirit. Jesus, may it be the case that Christ may dwell in our hearts, invading every space within us, that we would be rooted and grounded in your love, not our understanding of what love is, not our definition or expression of what love is, but grounded in your love. And as that happens, that we would then have the power, that we would have the assurance, that it would become inherent to who we are. Along with all of our brothers and sisters in Christ, that we would know the breadth, the length, the height, the depth of your love that surpasses knowledge. And the result of all of that, Lord, is that we would be filled to fullness, completely changed, completely transformed, completely different, because you now rule and reign over our lives. So, Lord, again, we surrender ourselves to you. We pursue you 
And Lord, we say, help us to reject any other soil that we might be grounded in this morning.